the IoT and Agriculture Capstone team. On the far side, you have Dale Chang, computer engineering major, and Scott Bull, and electrical engineering major, and then Justin Martin, also electrical engineering major. As an overview of what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to start and tell you a little bit about the background of this project and why we chose it and how it applies to different situations. Then I'll talk about some definitions and some terms that you may hear. I'll go into a little bit of design overview and then I'll hand it off and we'll talk about the components that are needed to make this design successful, as well as how we develop the design, our final system design, and then we'll go into some testing verification, a little bit of project management, and then the demonstration at the end will be the best for it. Okay, so you've probably seen this cow on our, on our shirts and on our poster. So we are the IoT and Agriculture team because this project was originally proposed for agriculture. So getting into agriculture in the United States, as of 2017, census is done by the United States Department of Agriculture. So there are 2.1 million farms in the United States with an average farm size of 444 acres. An interesting number that may surprise you is that family farms account for 89% of farm production in the United States. Um, total farm expenditures as of 2017 was $359.8 billion. And if you see about 11% of that is livestock and poultry. Zooming in a little bit more in agriculture, there's also the cattle industry. There are 913,246 cattle and calf ranches in the United States. Another really surprising fact is that the average age of a cattle ranch is actually 58.3 years old. Um, cattle production in 2016 accounted for $67.56 billion in calf receipts. So now I want to introduce the idea behind our project, so remote monitoring. So, our project idea centers around the fact that livestock water of these cattle and calf ranches has to be monitored to ensure there's still enough water for those cattle to drink and be healthy. So you may see why anybody cares, and that's why you saw those numbers on the previous two slides. It's worth a lot of money in, these, in the United States. Who does this monitoring? So generally it's done by the ranchers. You saw that average age is pretty high. And we actually met today a, a student in the, in the hallway out there that talked about how he was the person who had to go do this monitoring his own family's ranch and how he had to pull right up to all the different sources and make sure that there was still water. How often must this be done? That depends on where you are in the United States. If you know Arizona summers, you could have to check them way more often than, than in other areas. How far away is the object being monitored? Those uh, ranches could be 400 acres, so you could be as far as 400 acres away that you have to go check. As well as how difficult is it to get to the object? It depends on your land, but um, it could be very difficult dealing with different terrain to get to these so I'm going to introduce our project. We're able to use the Internet of Things technology that has enabled solutions to these remote monitoring problems. And the main goal is to use this technology to create a remote monitoring device for these agriculture applications I just described, as well as learn how to apply the solution to other remote monitoring situations. So this is actually a picture, a picture of my family's cabin in New Mexico. And my parents were really excited about this product when I told them about my capstone project as they wish they had something like this to monitor their property that they weren't at year round. Their main issues were weather. They were never sure if there was too much snow on the roads to get to this cabin, as well as the property conditions of, let's say, if the deck is eroding or something and they're not there, as well as, again, like I mentioned, the road conditions. So our device, and just very high level so you can tell what our device does, our device is the remote automatic photograph testing device. We we'll reference it pretty much from here on out as the wrapped. The purpose of this device is to automatically take a picture once a day and transmit that image through a cell phone 3G network to a user's phone. This device is solar powered, it's compact and weatherproof. You can see it's that black box right there, it's the final size of it. And it has to also be maintenance free. So when a user powers it on and leaves it out in the field, they don't have to keep going to it to defeat the purpose of the remote monitor. I want to go through some quick definitions that you may hear see or hear throughout the presentation up here we have 3G and then we have SMS and MMS there is a difference between the two SMS is sending text messages and MMS is sending multimedia such as pictures or videos you also see down here a watchdog timer which normally is just used for system reset we actually use it for uh, a sister uh, hardware timer on our system and then you'll see at the bottom you may hear us say both mock-up prototype as well as conforming prototype when we reference our mock-up prototype, that means our breadboard design, or the design that doesn't necessarily conform to every single requirement in the specification, such as, let's say, cost or size requirements, et cetera. And then you'll hear us talk about this con 
conforming prototype, which does conform to the entire specification. Okay. So moving into the design overview. These are the critical components used in this project. You'll see most of the names pretty, pretty clearly describe what the components do. So we have our controller up here, which controls our overall system, our camera, and SD card to store our images. You'll see these two right in the middle that I'm going to point out now because we'll get into more detail on them a little later. The cellular module is what transmits our image using MMS. In the purpose of this next diagram, you'll see that cell module includes the SIM card, but they'll be broken out later in more detail to uh, diagrams that you'll see as well as this charging controller, which helps us do the system power management. And that right now in this next diagram also includes our, our regulator. So now that I talk about them, you'll see this diagram right here, which is the basic connections that are done in this design. We start down at the bottom and see it is solar powered, so we can use solar, solar cells. We're actually just using a single cell in this design. As well as they connect to this charging controller, which does include an LDO. That directly regulates the charge going to and from the battery, as well as provides power to these components up here. The cell module, we'll talk about why later, takes its power directly off of the battery. In terms of what this basic functionality of this device is, you see this controller right in the middle, which is kind of the heart and the brains of the system. The flow of information is that the controller will request that the camera takes an image and then transmit the, transmits that image back to the controller, which then facilitates the storing of that on the SD card. The reason we need this SD card is our controller does not have enough on-chip memory to store the image itself, so we had to have some extra memory out there. The controller then will command the cellular module to download the image. It again comes through the controller to the cellular module, which then sends it to your cell phone. Okay, and now I'm going to hand off to Justin for some components. Now we'll get into the components selected for our final design. Because we're, most of these were also used in our development design, and I'll talk about the primary components and afterwards, Scott will talk about the secondary components. So first, we have our controller, the Amiga 320AP microcontroller, which is commonly used on development boards such as uh, Arduinos, which we will see later in our development design. Uh, for our final design, we used a 32-pin flat, flat package surface mount uh, to save space. It, will, it can run from 1.5 to 1.8 to 5.5 volts, uh, and we'll be using a 3.3 volts uh, with our implementation. It will talk to the camera and the cellular network module through UART communications and send commands such as take a picture, text a picture, and it will also receive feedback saying that the picture has been uh, captured. It has 20, volt, 20 programmable uh, input output pins that allow it to drive the camera and cellular network module as well as receive feedback such as if the battery is charging, the battery power level, and uh, I think that's it for now. And uh, as Holly mentioned, we have a flash drive timer hardware interrupt, which will allow the device to power down without actually resetting itself so that it can store data such as whether or not it has sent a picture today previously or not. Uh, next, we have our PDC-08 serial camera. Uh, it is video and picture cap capable. We'll be using it to return JPEG data through the controller and storing it on the SD card. Uh, it will do this through UART and it will also run at 3.3 volts as the through our uh, design so far. It has a 65 degree field of view, which will have a sample picture later, which you can see is a very good uh, range to see uh, whatever you want to take a picture of. And lastly, for our primary components, we have our cellular network module, the sim 16 a a standing for the American version that can run on American cellular network. Uh, cellular networks. And it also runs from 3.3 to 4.2 volts. And it is MMS capable, which means it will be able to send and transmit data, as well as text, anything else uh, that you would like it to, just like a normal phone. And it will receive commands through UART from the control. Now I'll hand it to Scott for the secondary components. All right, so the first of our secondary components is a, a charging controller for microchip. It's a 20-pin QFM package. It's going to allow us to take an input from our solar cell and then actively charge our uh, battery uh, right off of this chip. Um, it also has a 4.2-volt regulated output, which we're going to feed into a linear regulator, and I will explain that uh, in the next slide. Uh, but first, we have a solar cell here, um, IXYS solar cell. It's a very small 44.5 by 21.5 uh, millimeter cell. 
It's uh, got a maximum power output of 162 milliwatts. Um, I'll go over some power budget later and I'll explain to you how this is uh, plenty of power for our system. Next we have our 500 milliamp LiPo battery. Uh, it's got a voltage range between three and 4.2 volts. Um, this lines up perfectly with the voltage input of our cellular module, which we will actually power directly from this battery. Uh, the reason for this is that the cell module, while it's transmitting, has a lot of current pulses that can range up to upwards to two amps. So coming off the battery is uh, what we will implement, and I'll show that in our schematic later. So for our final secondary components, we first have a four gigabyte SD card. Uh, this will allow us to store our captured images and then uh, pull from that uh, from our cell module to transmit. Um, the reason we chose a 4 gigabyte SD card is because it's the most economical solution. If you look at prices for any other SD card below or above 4 gigabytes, uh, this is actually the cheapest one you can get. Uh, for our linear regulator, uh, it's going to have a 3.3 volt output. Um, the 4.2 volts from our battery charging controller is what's going to feed into this linear regulator. Uh, this 3.3 volt output is what we will feed into our camera, our SD card, and our Atmega 320P microcontroller. Uh, we also have this uh, key lock power switch. Uh, the reason we chose this is so that, um, as per our requirements for this project, we just want a user to be able to have a one-time activation and not have to worry about the system turning on and off if they want to or not. So what the user will do is have a key, and split the switch, take the key out, and not have to worry about this system ever again. And finally, we have an antenna with two DVI gain, uh, omnidirectional, and uh, once we go over the container, you'll be able to get a closer look at that. All right, so we're gonna move on to design development, kind of describing um, how we created our mock-up prototype here, with, if you see all the wires, that's our mock-up prototype, um, on two breadboards. And so, um, for our design development, it's just to prove the basic functionality of our design. Um, for the design development, um, we have chosen the Arduino Uno and two stackable shields, um, mainly because uh, they consist of all the components that we need for our final design. And uh, these tasks here are identifying um, all the things that we need to prove in order to make sure that our design is feasible for our custom PCB design. Uh, so first off, for system verification, um, we need to make sure that we can control the camera and that the picture can be transferred from the camera after it takes that image to the SD card via the controller. The controller directs, direct, directs that through. Um, and then after that happens, it pulls the uh, stored image from the SD card into cellular module um, to be sent out uh, to the user. And power estimations will be covered later uh, based off of our mock proto uh, mock-up prototype. First off, for our development board, we have the controller, um, the Arduino Uno, which uses the Atmega 328P, which is exactly what we use for our final uh, design. This board itself takes in seven volts to 12 volts, and it has a five volt output power pin that we will use to power the other two development boards that will be covered later. It has a 16 megahertz external oscillator, and um, as you will see later, this is actually twice the time that we want to run for our final design. And it communicates via software serial, UART, to the other, uh, to the camera and to the cellular module. So what software serial is, is pretty much hardware UART, but just programmed into, sorry, this is UART programmed into digital pins as software UART. Um, so, correction, not hardware UART. And the reason why we use software serial to communicate is uh, for uh, the cellular module is because there's only one um, UART hardware, hardware UART output, and while we're programming this Uno through the serial connection here, um, it disables the, UR, the hardware UR connection. So therefore, we're using uh, two software serials uh, out to the camera and the cellular module uh, for programming purposes only. And we have 20 pins, uh, 14 digital and six analog pins for our use. Next, we have the SD card shield. This takes in five volts and it stacks with the Uno um, and this takes in the standard SD card size. Um, it shows eight gigabytes, but we're actually using four. For our final design, we'll have a, a micro SD card, but for our mock-up prototype, we are using a standard one. And it communicates to the controller via SPI um, using these four pins, MISO, MOSI, uh, just select, and SDK. For our cellular module breakout board, we have the IT3G shield. 
This uses the SIM 5216A, shown here, um, connected to the antenna, as uh, covered before. And um, this is gonna be the exact SIM module or its seller module that we're gonna use for our final design. Um, this board itself takes in five volts, but it is regulated. Uh, there's a 3.3 volt, or sorry, 4.2 volt regulator on here uh, for the SIM module that is um, done by the board. And this stacks with the UNO, as um, talked about before, and also uh, has a UART MUX shown here, one to eight MUX for UART, so we didn't want to connect more than one, which we really don't need to. There is that there for us to use. And there are pins and buttons for power on and reset. Uh, so the power on and reset pins, or the buttons are here, and we can connect the pins in to um, you know, tell software to turn it on and to reset and prepare for another uh, MMS or SMS sending. Here's our hardware development diagram. So starting off, our controller is powered by an external power supply, DC power supply, and it's connected to the computer via the serial um, connection via USB. This is how we program the controller and upload new software. From the controller, it connects to the SD card um, through a five volt connection pinout from the controller, and that five volt is also fed to the camera and to the cell module as well. Um, that's how they power all three other devices and through here, these four, as covered before, is SBI connections to the SD card. And software serial, transmit and receive, is sent to the cell module and to the camera to communicate, um, to take the, the image taken from the camera and feed it to the cell module and to send commands back and forth. In addition, we have the reset and power on pins to control the cell module uh, to turn it on and initiate that serial connection. Moving on to software. So this is the high level software flow. Uh, this is to demonstrate, once again, the basic functionality of our design. Um, overall, this is gonna take around 63 seconds to power on, do everything it does, send that image and turn off. First thing it does uh, is that the controller powers up the cellular network module and enables that serial connection so it can communicate and send uh, commands, AT commands in specific, uh, to the cell module and get a response back. And that takes around 1.6 seconds to do. After that, the controller tells the camera to turn on and turns on the SD card as well. After that happens, uh, that takes around half a second. After that happens, then it commands the camera to take that image, which barely takes any time, and transfer that image from the camera to the controller. There, after that, where that it stores onto the SD card, which actually takes the longest, around 31 seconds max. Um, for configuring the MMS and cellular module, that has to be done right afterwards to prepare the cellular network module for MMS. Um, as before it was, it was configured for SMS, we have to prepare for MMS um, and send a lot of settings through and get it ready. And that takes around 2.6 seconds. And after that happens, we command the cellular module to download that image from the SD card through um, to the cell module um, and for it to be transmitted out to the user, which takes 8 seconds and 20 seconds afterwards. Um, so once again, the total time is around 63 seconds, just a little bit over a minute. And there's two things here that fluctuates the most. It's going to be the 31 seconds and the 20 seconds. 31 seconds depends on the size of the image or how much light is outside. Um, that affects the um, file size that's being stored as the SD card, which affects the amount of time that it takes to download that image and store. And also, the 20 seconds here, that's the amount of time that it takes to transmit, and that depends on the amount of network connectivity that's out there in the rural area. This is a sample image that's taken right outside our awesome building, the building uh, King Engineer. Um, and this is showing the distance that it could capture. Um, this is, um, you can also see that it's a 65 degree field of view as covered by Justin earlier. So this shows, just kind of demonstrates um, what we can see from the outside. Okay, moving on to final system design. Justin. Yes, and uh, bridging from our development design, I'll uh, show how we have realize this in a final uh, total encompassing design. So building off of his hardware flow, this is our uh, final system pin level design which shows most of the connections we have. Uh, before, we didn't have our SIM card included which will attach on the back side of our cellular network module and could be an AT&T, TriPhone, or Verizon, whichever network you prefer. And you will have a cellular subscription through them so you'll be able to send the texts. Next we have our in-circuit programming so that we can burn our code onto our microcontroller as well as has most of the same connections to write uh, 
the JPEG data to the SD card. And we can only use one of these at a time. Next we have our 8 megahertz resonator, which will control the frequency that our microcontroller will run at. And here is our power system, which has a solar panel and a battery as the input to our charging controller, which will provide power and other data such as ambient sunlight and battery voltage to our controller. Next, uh, I'll give to Scott for our system schematic. All right, so there's a lot going on here, so I'm just gonna go over some key areas of our schematic just so you can get a big picture of what we're trying to achieve. Uh, starting in the lower right here, uh, we have our battery connector uh, that's going to be mounted on top of our PCB. Um, it's going to be uh, going through our key lock switch that I mentioned earlier, uh, which will electrically disconnect our battery from the system. Uh, once the user gets their hand on the product and finishes mounting it in the area they want to, all they simply have to do is turn the switch and the system will power on by itself. Um, next we have a solar cell input going into our uh, battery charging controller. And you'll see here in the upper left here we have two status indication pins. Uh, the first one is to determine if we have an input into our battery charging controller and the next stat, uh, status indication pin is to determine if we are actively charging our battery or not. Uh, that uh, battery charging controller then feeds into our linear regulator, which will then break out to our Atmega 328P microcontroller, our SD card, and our uh, camera up here. So moving up to the, to the left side of our Atmega here, we have a six pin header that we've broken out so that we can uh, program our microcontroller. Uh, some of those pins include uh, the MISO, MOSI, CLOCK, and CHIP SELECT pins, as well as our uh, a five volt input from uh, another Arduino Uno, which we will use to program our microcontroller. Uh, we also have a uh, transistor network here uh, so that we can uh, send a higher low signal to uh, apply 3.3 volts of power to our camera. Uh, the camera uh, Connections are also broken out to a header so that we can directly connect to our camera. Uh, we also have uh, our UART connections going to our uh, 5216A cellular module. Uh, we are implementing some level shifting so we can achieve the appropriate voltages going into the input of our cellular module. Next, we also have uh, our 8 megahertz external ceramic resonator, as well as uh, some uh, control lines, the digital outputs for our reset and power go into our cellular module. Uh, lastly, we have a SIM card connector here that's going to be mounted on top of our PCB and uh, ESD pr uh, diode array so that we can protect our uh, SIM card from uh, uh, damage when uh, taking it in and out of the connector. Uh, finally, we have another transistor network here coming off of the cell module. This will allow us to determine if the cell module has achieved a network connection or not. Uh, what it does is it blinks an LED uh, 800 milliseconds on and off if it's actively searching for a network, and eight, uh, 200 milliseconds on and off if a network connection has been achieved. This just will go into some layout. So, bridging from our uh, development design, we, need, uh, we have to meet our size requirement, which means taking our whole development design and putting it inside of our container that we have here. So what we uh, will contain all of our components, and it includes many test points and LEDs to allow us to test individual components and test different parts of our code as we run through it. So here is the top layer of our board. Uh, we have most of the components on top, uh, such as our uh, header pins for our controller and programming, uh, our microcontroller, which is in the middle here, as well as the SIM 5216A, which takes up most of the space on top. And we do have lots of test points, such as this to test the solar panel, and uh, an LED right here, so that we can have a heartbeat for our program to make sure that our device is on and running. And then we have the bottom layer, which uh, contains our ground plane and a couple other connections, such as the SD card and SIM card. And then here is our final printed device that we ordered uh, that we have began populating and testing. And I'll go to the power budget. 
All right, so uh, a requirement of our system is that we are able to run for 12 hours without uh, receiving a charge from our solar cell. Uh, so I'm gonna go through uh, some of the power consumption values of our system and then how our solar cell will replenish our battery. Um, one thing to note is uh, because we are using a 16 megahertz uh, external oscillator on our development board and an eight megahertz uh, external oscillator on our uh, production design, uh, a lot of the uh, run times that you saw in the uh, high-level software flow will be increased, and I'll go over that. Uh, lastly, just for a quick note, uh, a lot of these values that we have are either from a day sheet or values that we've tested from our development design that you see. So jumping right into it, um, we listed a uh, major current consumption from our uh, critical components, such as our controller while it's in our active mode, our cell module uh, while, while it's uh, initializing, our cell module while it's transmitting, our camera, and our SD card. Uh, I've also taken into account uh, the controller while it's in its power down mode with the watchdog, watchdog timer running, as well as the other critical components in our off states. Now, one thing is, uh, to note here is that, um, once again, the cell module while it's transmitting can pulse up to two amps, so um, I went ahead and in the worst case scenario, uh, added uh, two amps for the full estimated time of 20 seconds of transmitting. Um, if we go through and run through the list, uh, we come out with a total current consumption of about 19 milliamp hours within a single day. So uh, going into what our solar cell can uh, replenish our battery with, um, based off values uh, that we researched uh, for the northern hemisphere, uh, the maximum amount of sunlight that you can get is about 1,000 watts per square meter. So at that maximum value, it was calculated that our solar cell could output a maximum power of 162 milliwatts. If we go down to 60% and 30%, which um, uh, goes over what the amount of sunlight you can receive during the summertime in partly cloudy conditions, in wintertime in partly cloudy conditions, we can also calculate the amount of po maximum power the solar cell can uh, give to the system, and then from there determine how many uh, how many uh, hours it would take for our solar cell to, re to replenish our battery for well, one day's worth of charge, that 19 milliamp hours uh, charge. So it's about half an hour to about two hours uh, with favorable conditions, and the time for a full charge, the full 500 milliamp hours, uh, ranges from 15 to 55 hours. So just to kind of help visualize this, uh, we did make a plot here, uh, which shows that we have a max charge line of 500 milliamps. So with 100% uh, solar radi incoming solar radiation, and using the average amount of sunlight that uh, we receive here in the United States, which is roughly seven hours in a day, uh, we can see that it takes roughly two days for the, uh, for the uh, battery to be fully recharged from our solar cell with uh, the maximum solar radiation available to us in the northern hemisphere, ranging to about uh, seven and a half days for uh, wintertime partly cloudy conditions. So going into our container, we chose a weatherproof polycarbonate enclosure, uh, which meets our size requirements. Uh, it also, this container meets IP66 and IP68 dust uh, and water weatherproof, weatherproof conditions and as well ha has four PCB mounting bosses so that we can uh, securely mount our PCB inside the enclosure. Um, we did do some modifications uh, to our container. Uh, what we did here is we utilized the uh, mounting brackets that come standard with this enclosure to mount the container vertically and then have our camera uh, coming out of the top uh, portion of the container. Uh, you can see here we also have the antenna coming out the side and that uh, key lock switch on the bottom so our uh, user can uh, turn the system on and want to have activation. Uh, you, can, you can see right here at the very top, we do have our solar cell, uh, which uh, is at the top of the container. So for testing and verification, just to go over. So for testing and verification, uh, once we received our final PCB, we uh, began populating it and uh, testing various components like to verify each of the hardware components when we first got them to ensure that they worked. We then began assembling the device to make sure it met our size specifications. 
And then we were going to get into our functional requirements, such as sending pictures, uh, working on our power budget, and the timing for our power download. And like I said, with the assembly previous non-functional requirements set, such as size, weight, and the waterproofness. So what we've been able to test so far is verified our individual hardware components. Also, we've been able to program our Mega 320P microcontroller. Uh, we've been able to provide power, power to it externally and with our battery. And we've also been able to capture an image and sort it on an SD card. What we haven't done is been able to send MMS. The connector that we received is a millimeter too short for the mating height, so our SIM does not probably fit into it. So if we can get that fixed or find a way around it, we'll be able to just program our microcontroller and send a text. Also, we have not done environmental testing or tested the battery charging controller with the solar panel. Next, we'll go over the bill of materials with Scott. All right, so going over bill of materials real quick. Um, we go ahead and uh, I have two columns here, uh, one for uh, single part costs for all the components that we utilize in the production version of our uh, design, as well as pricing per 1,000 parts for all of our uh, production components. Uh, going through here, uh, we have a total cost of about $168 uh, for single part costing and uh, $119 for our per 1,000 part costing, uh, which gives us about a $48 difference uh, per unit uh, with our bill materials. show you that we did have a schedule that we followed, and I'm sorry, Dr. David, it's still red, but we did label it. It is spring break, right in the middle, you see that big red block. We're down here all the way at the end. If you've seen, we, the only main issues we ran into was down at the very end of our schedule where we finally received the custom PCB and we're starting to test it, but we were only able to fully verify the uh, mock-up prototype. So after this, I'm going to go into a demonstration video to show you guys actually the mock-up prototype fully working so you can see how that happened. My name is Holly Ross and I'm the design team lead for the IoT and Agriculture Capstone team. The remote automatic photograph testing device, or the RAPT as we like to call it, is a remote monitoring device that's equipped with a camera, a set of the network module, as well as a microcontroller. The agricultural application that we originally designed this device for is livestock out in a ranch and they have a remote water source out there so you would point this device and the camera at that water source. So the rancher would be able to monitor the level of the water for the livestock without having to physically go and check it. Now I'm going to demonstrate the functionality of the wrap. All I'm going to have to do is power it on and it should automatically take a picture of our team's logo over here and then text it to the user's phone. So we just push the power button and you saw the one LED turn on. The device is capturing the image right now and attempting to communicate with the cellular network module. We see it just begin blinking, so we now have a network connection. And once we see it begin to blink faster than it was previously, we'll know that it is transmitting the image to our user's phone. Now there is the faster blink. Okay, so now that the blink is slowed down again, we know that the image was sent. And you can see that image of our T logo was sent to this cell. requirements did you consider the operating temperature of all of this all of these equipments yes we did and I could not give you the identical temperature requirements but there are uh, temperature requirements that go from and operating temperatures of zero degrees C to 
Okay. Is there any way to get that zero degrees lower? Not without having the battery uh, slowly discharge. Because okay. when it starts reaching lower temperatures, uh, not only will it discharge, but it won't bulge, uh, won't be able to actively recharge the solar cell. Do you have any estimate of its survival temperature? No. Not Just so it can come up in the spring? Oh, okay. Thank you. So, uh, what is the cost for the, the uh, cellular subscription and, and what are the limitations on that for your device? So, in addition to the initial yeah. cost, what would be after annual? Yeah, so an interesting thing and in what we've been using on this is just a subscription basis. So you could generally, in production, let's say this would come with a SIM card and you would go on and activate it. You could do certain cellular plans saying $5.99 a month for this many, for this much data on it. That's entirely a cost based on the user. Um, Dr. Post was kind of our user in this project, so he, uh, so he worked up with us to make sure that we had a cellular plan. But generally a, a subscription basis and it's not incredibly expensive. It's, Ten bucks a month if you're sending a lot more pictures in just one a day. And, and how much power are you saving by going from 16 megahertz to 8 megahertz? And how much of a difference does that make in the power consumption? Uh, all of our power values were calculated with uh, the 8 megahertz time. Uh, I don't have a value for the 16 megahertz. Um, though I will, I will say that uh, if we did run the microcontroller at 16 megahertz. We would have to increase the voltage going to our Atmega 320P to by uh, five volts instead of the 3.3 coming from a linear rating. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's why part of the reason we decided to go with more of a visual representation on slide 39, I believe, because this does take you back towards uh, the charge in terms of milliamp hours, uh, but I do see where you're coming in with uh, milliwatts, so I should change that back. You have a bucket, which is energy, but why hours or something along those lines, and all of a sudden I'm in milliamp line, and as I look at your radiation, I happen to know that in the state of New Mexico, in the state of Arizona, here where we are, if I lock a solar panel in the optimal geometry and don't move it, I'm going to get about 5.5 hours per day of sunshine. And your estimates seem really optimistic and very casual about the way in which you place the geometry of the panel. Do you think that might affect anything? Yes, uh, definitely. If, if the solar cell is uh, not in the optimal position, you're not going to get uh, some of these favorable uh, charging times, like two, three days, it might it would definitely extend out to what you can see here in 30% solar radiation, uh, more than like seven, eight days. So what is your, what do you get on? In future designs, we're thinking of putting a posable solar panel so that no matter how you mount the device, you can get the right angle for maximum sunlight. on a periodic basis that the user can set, or is it hard-coded? So right now, it's, it's hard-coded into the device for you. Um, it's very simple to change that. What really defines it is our sleep modes that we go into, because we check. We can watch our camera, we can sleep for eight seconds at a time, and then we wake back up and make sure that we can get a network connection, et cetera. So we could, you can absolutely change that to send you two pictures a day, uh, et cetera. Right now, it's just on a daily basis. In production, it would be a really interesting way to implement it that the user could say, I want two pictures a day or one picture every three days, et cetera, and it would be so just a plug into the code. Have a little control over that power. Yeah, so they'd have a little control, yeah, and that would and that would definitely impact uh, the times, the transmitting times, et cetera, that, that raise up how much power. Right. I realize it's supposed to be like super easy to operate, yeah. but it could also send data back to the phone to tell you, you know, 
but at this rate, there's some power that it's going to be effective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so at one point in your presentation, you said that you would command the cellular module to download the image from the SD card. Yes. Does it do that without going through the CPU? No, it still goes through the controller. The interesting, that's the interesting link. Originally, we were attempting to not have it do that. But what happens is, you saw, if I can go all the way back to the flow of this, too, to show you. And you'll actually notice, too, that the storage as well as the downloading times are a little bit different. So we do have to store through the controller. And then this, where we have to download through the controller, it's a command that says download. And because you give it the file name, it just links to the SD card. There's no processing that has to be done through there, but it still has to link through that um, controller. So that it just sense? tells the controller to create the connection and then the, it's just no. Yeah, it's a, it basically is one command that says it's a, called CMMS down. It says download this and it um, makes that connection through the so controller. The block diagram of the, the layout that that was the previous one. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Yes. Right. So it's. The controller just knows that that's all it's doing, and then it just goes and goes out. Yeah, it's basically a middleman that doesn't do anything to that data, but it says, download this image. This requests that image, which can then find the name based on this, and then it comes back to the desktop or serial. So how many images do you keep on the SD card? Right now, we're actually just every day, we overwrite that same image. So just one? You, yep, so just one. So that four gigabytes is huge for uh, um, how much you, need our images are. Do you want like a ring buffer kind of thing? Yeah, we could. Yeah, we absolutely could. Um, or you could decide you want to save, you know, keep five images, and then start overwriting like you're, right. like you're suggesting to make sure that I still have some storage, because then I can pull that SD card out and look at it myself if I really, really wanted to. Uh, like a history or something. But yeah, but for as of right now, we are just overwriting that image, because mm -hmm. we're not dealing with the okay. resolution. So like, whenever I've tried to pick computer components for like a personal project, I found myself completely overwhelmed by the amount of choice that's out there. Yeah. Um, how do you guys like ferret out, you know, other components that are out there? And you're like, yeah, I don't want that one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So if I go, my main decisions, um, most of these, I decided on the App Mega as well as the cellular module. Uh -huh. Pretty much all of us we proposed separate designs. Everyone chose the same camera, <laughs> uh, but then we all had some different controllers and cellular modules. So my main thing was actually starting with finding two components that could easily interface with each other, as well as this was my defining factor was the cellular module because it had to be MMS capable. So that eliminated a ton from my, uh, from my choices. And then as soon as I picked that cellular module, I knew that I could communicate with it through UART. And I said, what's an easy thing that I can program and send commands through UART? And that's how I ended up at the, uh, at the controller. And I found the Arduino Uno first which contains this controller, so that's how I was able to piece it together. But definitely the largest part of our previous semester was in selecting components, and I would probably think that was the hardest part for all of us, was in determining you know, which one is best. And there's definitely multiple options that could work. But, uh, but I think for sure that's, that's the hardest part, is just spending a lot of time researching. But I would suggest find the main things it has to do, and then go from there and say, you know, this is cool, but I don't know if it works with the main things. It was for me, it was finding MMS capable um, and an up-to-date sim that wouldn't get phased out with the technology changes. So yeah. with the 3G, do you have some sense of how far from working in cell tower you could install this thing and still be in connection? We don't have uh, an exact distance from the cell towers. The main reason we use 3G was just due to the extensive coverage in the United States of 3G, because one of the main things you would want to continue updating is let's say taking eventually 5G once it, once it shows up. But um, but yeah, for us, we don't have an exact distance from a cell tower. We just went along the lines of 3G networks are pretty encompassing in the United States. So if there's somewhere where your cell phone could get a 3G network connection, then we'll get a 3G network connection for yeah, you. The 3G range is better than that. It's, it's more extensive. It's the most extensive and easiest to deal with for us. As well. yeah. Did you give any thought to a setup mode? That is, when someone's using this, they're probably going to want to take multiple pictures in rapid succession to see how they have it aimed, see what's in the way, see how it's working. Yeah. Did, did you give any thought in the design to how that would be handled? We, we have not implemented that in any way. It would be, um, it's a very interesting idea. Uh -huh. I, I like 
bad idea in terms of being able to tell. As of right now, it would just, if they turned it on and didn't touch it again, they'd get, you know, one picture a day and say, okay, I need to adjust it. So that's not really the best way to do it. Um, but absolutely, that's a, that's a great way to implement something. Yeah. So how does the user uh, tell this device uh, which phone number to send the pictures to? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in the software, so what would happen in a true production environment is you would say, this is my cell phone number, I want it to text, and you can actually input multiple ones if you wanted to. But in the code, it's a simple when we say, um, there's a simple command that when we say to send, it just inputs that cell phone number hard-coded into it, and it will send it to however many numbers have been added as recipients. Would it support emailing? Hmm? Will it support emailing? Yes, yeah, it will. It's actually about the same sequence. The commands are just barely different where you would put in, instead of a phone number, you can put in an email address, and it'll do the same thing for you. <coughs> Sort of on the lines of the other question, there must be quite a few cellular model, modules out there. Mm -hmm. um, you arrived at this one quickly, or did you ponder it for days, or what? I pondered it for probably weeks. <laughs> In the previous semester, I went through multiple different designs for this one. Um, I ended up coming back to this one. A lot of it was the MMS capability, as well as I once I started looking into I could actually order one of these things. Mm -hmm. This one actually we got it from China, so <laughs> it was it was definitely a, a reach on that. So so yeah, I it definitely wasn't days. It was I was iterating on the design I wanted and then trying to find that component that would for sure fit it. Up against time. Yeah, up against time in, in the fall semester where we write the proposals. What was your biggest breakdown? In this project. In this project. Well, if you want to know my personal failure, you could always just say one. none. Um, <laughs> well, I'd say none in the Mako prototype. I think that's it's a really awesome the video that you saw. Um, our biggest failure on this is that the custom PCB does not quite work due to that mating height of that connector. So our biggest wow. failure would probably be our lack of time to get a new connector or turn a new board for that, um, because it would have been really cool to demonstrate that one perfectly working. But overall, we see this as a big success. It's kind of seeing that cellular module working. There's quite a few people online who want solutions to this, so it's kind of cool to have figured one out. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, what are the file sizes of the images in this video? Typically, we get about 15 kilobytes. 15 kilobytes? 50. 50 kilobytes? Yep. Okay, and what is the baud rate of the software you are using? There's 15K. Okay. Um, does that connection to the cell module report uh, support receiving commands as well? To or back to the controller? Information from the cell module, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so, so from both the camera as the cell module, they can receive acknowledgments from them saying, okay, I'm ready, etc. Okay. Um, so uh, my other question is about the environmental protection. Okay. Uh, you said that the box that you're buying off the shelf is rated for. Well yeah, do you want to see it? You're welcome to see it. I'll, I'll come take a look later. But uh, does the fact that you drove a bunch of holes in it affect that? Yeah, it caused an issue. We'd have to officially seal all of them in to maintain the, that IP rating. We haven't sealed all those components in because we've been back and forth between the two designs. But absolutely, right now, if you dumped water on it, I would not be too confident. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I was going to say, go ahead. <laughs> So since David brought up the box, yes. and we talked a little bit about the temperature range operating range and survival range for electronics, do you think might happen to a black box like that sitting in direct sunlight, say, oh, be in the summer? Do you have any idea warm. what the temperature might be on the inside? Yeah. I've cooked a camera here. Yeah. I've cooked a oh, camera here. Oh, oh, absolutely, yeah. Just in the sun, yeah. yeah so absolutely. So it would get, it would definitely get you boil water in that thing. On the other end of the spectrum, taking back again to the conversation about battery, yes. did you tell us what kind of battery you have, chemistry, etc.? Uh, yeah, the Lipo battery. You ever left your cell phone outside in the snow? No, I have not. See where I'm going? See, that, that's one of the principal weaknesses of that chemistry, is the ability to operate at low temperatures. Go below about minus 20 C, you're toast, that battery's gone. If you try charging it much below zero, uh, you can do severe damage to the battery. On the other end of the spectrum, going up high, so that chemistry might not be the most rugged for what you're 
before yeah. and after. Yeah, I would say the reason the lipo battery is used is due to that cell modules pulses of the two amp pulses that it passed out. So the reason we made sure it's connected direct to that is why we use the lipo battery because those are more able to sustain those direct big pulses from the battery. But the side is not going to be much use. Yeah, it's not going to be much use if it's really hot or something <coughs> outside. So I think definitely if we could keep taking this further, then we could start attacking the mechanical aspects and the environmental aspects, maybe find a, an EE on the energy track or something to help us out with some of that. But but it's definitely considerations that would have to happen. You couldn't sit this in Phoenix Sun, and you couldn't sit this in Alaska. You could, uh, can you separate the solar cells so you can make like a sun shield compared to the solar cell? Point of wall, you know, oh, it's yeah. Nice it's integral. Oh, yeah. Right, and, and right now, absolutely. But like you can mentioned, being able to twist it or being able to, to and, and, and the shield the box or the box. Yeah, exactly. Or having, or having it, yeah. But somewhere where it's not getting and just the, the solar city. Yeah. Because having them together means the box will be the direct sunlight. Um, since you were down regulating voltage to, I believe, three volts, for uh, the uh, controller, uh, but I noticed you said you used an, L an LDO for that. Uh, why did you use that instead of a switcher? Since power is a concern. Uh, well, it was a suggestion that we use a, a LDO for our system. Uh, we wanted to find something with a low quiescent current uh, so that uh, when our system is in, in an off state, that we won't draw very much power over the period of 23-ish hours. Well, switchers can do that too. Just a concern for the next revision. something you didn't, I don't think you covered, which is what do you think the production cost of this would be? The actual production cost of yeah. this? We don't have estimates for the production cost. All we give to you. I want to buy a thousand of them right now. Yeah, what would it cost me? So this is what we can give you right now is that this was what um, Scott brought up in terms of if you just to produce a single part, it would be uh, a single uh, wrapped device would be $168. But if you were to buy a thousand part quantities, then you drop that price about $48 down to 119 right now. Now you could also cut that in production and you know, order more than 1,000, or you could also, in terms of. Uh, does that number testing. include assembly and testing? It, it does not include oh. assembly and testing. I've heard some people use a factor of three when the parts cost to the total price. So yeah. that would get you 400 and something dollars. And then when you add some profit, you'd probably be at about. Six eight hundred dollar module for an initial introduction. That's not too bad. If you could, I don't know what rangers would want to pay, but it strikes me that if you could get the price under two hundred dollars in a production agree. unit, you'd probably have a market. Yeah, I would agree. Their, their other option is fully automated pressurized systems for their water tanks. So if you could get them, you know, a couple of these, and and like I said, I just met a kid out there today that said, hey, this would have been awesome for me when my job was to drive out there. And and that, that might be an option for the future product, which yeah. is not only photographs, but a few sensors, such as water level. Yes, yeah. or, or temperature sensors as right, well. Or, or dinosaur detectors or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, you could motion detect if you wanted to with that camera. <laughs> so you could detect if the dinosaur is drinking your water. <laughs> How would you improve the capstone program? Uh, myself? Um, I think for us it was, I would say time, but you're not going to like that answer because everyone will tell you time. Oh, I hear a lot of answers <laughs> I don't like. 
So, so we would all like to have more time. I think our capstone, the interesting idea was that we all, you know, we all proposed individual proposals, which I think is an amazing industry-like um, event, but what it would have been cool for us, and we've discussed a couple times, you know, if we were able to make this proposal together, we could have done it quicker, and then spent more time on something such as the PCB, et cetera. So maybe not having individual proposals or having those being completed earlier in the fall semester to where we could have gotten something started here and had over that winter break to do more um, would okay. be what I would say. Well, I'll take that under advice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.